Welcome. Today on Hollywood Stunt Makers. You're gonna act like that. Dinner is out, baby. How about a movie? <laughs> now on Hollywood Stunt Makers, women who do stunts. <laughs> Today on Hollywood Stunt Makers, we'll meet some daring women past and present who do stunts. And we'll talk to some actresses who have done their own stunts. The beautiful Ann Archer tells us how she got more than she bargained for, doing her own stunts for the film Narrow Margin. I can't just don't think about it, just do it. I did all the, the sequences on the train at the end. The reason actors like to do their own stunts is that it ensures the reality of the scene. And sometimes, it can be really scary. Those were not backdrops, that was me. <laughs> we were cabled, but uh, as I used to bitterly complain to our director, Peter, Peter Himes, I don't want to fall and find out what it feels like to get saved by the cable. So I would complain a lot, hoping that they wouldn't ask me to do anything worse than they already asked me to do. And then he would, he would use psychology on me and he'd say now and uh, I don't want you to do anything that you're really uncomfortable with and at that point I would feel very guilty and so I'd make myself do it the safety cable attaching the actress to the train had to be creatively hidden to ensure total safety while giving audiences the illusion that real danger exists in this death-defying sequence where Gene Hackman's character battles the villain close-ups of the stars are intercut with footage of stuntmen these trained risk takers do this kind of work for a living, but considering the speed of the train and the treacherous terrain, you can rest assured they employ the exact same safety precautions used by Ann Archer. As with any action scene, numerous cameras were placed in various positions on the train and on the helicopters to allow for fast-paced cutting. It was very scary, and I was really scared, and it was hard to do. And um, uh, I'm glad I did it now. I don't know if I'd do it again. <laughs> Here's the Academy Award-winning actress Kathy Bates in the psychological thriller Misery. Any other crucial requirements that need satisfying? Well, just the, the paper will be fine. Are you sure? Because if you want, I'll bring back the whole store for you. Annie, uh, what, what's the matter? What's the matter? I'll tell you what's the matter. I go out of my way for you. I do everything to try and make you happy. I feed you, I clean you, I dress you, and what thanks do I get? Oh, you bought the wrong paper, Annie. I can't write on this paper, Annie. Well, I'll get your stupid paper, but you just better start showing me a little more appreciation around here, Mr. Man. Annie really drives the piece. She really, uh, um, She's the protagonist, you know, and, and, and she makes the thing go. And, and whereas the character of Paul is more responsive and reactive, you know, so it took a lot of gas to get through that. <laughs> this is my first lead in a picture, and, and with a director like Rob Reiner, you know, that's enough to get you up and going in the morning. And, and uh, he had a terrific group of people on the set, a great crew just great people and so it was a real joy to go to work every day so I, that kind of fired me up every morning you know kept me going we had some doubles that did some of the longer shots but we did about 95 percent of it ourselves and uh 
that was a unique experience for me because <laughs> I've never done anything like that before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, uh, that was an amazing experience to me because uh, you were exhausted by the end of the day. The next day you were so sore you could hardly walk, you know, and you just had to forget it and just throw yourself into it. Well, I don't want it on my conscience that I burned up Captain Page. At the end of the movie, it's okay, it's okay. if you die, but not at this point. No, 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 misery! Although this fight looks dangerous, the filmmakers go to great lengths to avoid injury to the star, which could set production back for months. Special effects makeup serves to enhance Ms. Bates' performance. The use of fake blood in the shot helps to sell the idea that the actress is embroiled in a fight for her life. It took us about five or six days, you know, to shoot that whole sequence, and Annie got progressively, uh, you know, more bloody and more beat up and bruised and stuff. So that was weird, you know. I didn't get to sit with people and eat at lunch with them. I had to kind of go hide in my trailer. <laughs> she didn't want to inflict that on somebody while they were eating, you know. To misery. To misery. We'll be back with more action when Hollywood Stunt Makers continues. Robocop was one of the most successful action pictures in recent history, and also one of the few films that features a woman as a hands-on crime fighter. Nancy Allen and Peter Weller portray cops in futuristic Detroit, hunting down the bad guys. Stuntwoman Ginny Everett doubles for Nancy Allen in this high-speed chase through the inner city, an example of the necessity for the stuntwoman today. But in the early days of movie making, when a scene called for a dangerous stunt involving a woman, it was usually done by a man. All the driving, riding, falling, and jumping needed for action films was performed by a man in a dress until it was time for the close-up. Stunts were considered too dangerous or too difficult for a woman to handle. This was in the early 1900s, after all. Filmmakers simply counted on audiences not looking too closely. In this scene, a woman is clearly riding the horse. But when it's time to jump from the horse to the stagecoach, a man steps in. Of course, there was a select group of women who went against the grain of Hollywood and insisted on doing their own stunts. These were the serial stars, such as Pearl White, who began her career in 1914 with The Perils of Pauline, and Helen Gibson in The Hazards of Helen. In this scene from D.W. Griffith's Way Down East, that's really Lillian Gish and Richard Bartholomus acting with real ice and a real waterfall. This was shot in 1919 long before stunt making evolved into a precise science so safety precautions were minimal watch how close these daring actors get to the very brink of disaster it wasn't until the 1930s until things really started to change women began doubling for female stars the first stunt women had backgrounds as diverse and as wild as their personalities they were fearless and attempted amazing feats. We're lucky to have two pioneers in the world of stunts who are still working. Lila Finn and Mae Boss. I got started in the business coming from a rodeo background. I was a trick rider with rodeos. And I actually had no inclination to be a stunt woman. And consequently, I was called to do a stunt and I really didn't know what I should be doing. I mean, I said, I, I just have an extra card. And they said, well, you dummy, go get your Screen Actors Guild card. And it just sort of evolved from that. The first stunt I, I did, actually, I replaced a girl on a series called Country Doctor, which involved driving teams, falling horses. It was all horsework. It was a little Country Doctor Western. And so I learned a great deal right there on the set. You know, you have to have a background of some sort. And as I said, I was a trick rider. I came in that way. And of course, there were, at the time I came into the business, westerns were big. 
so I just sort of went from one to the other, but I did almost nothing but horse work at one time. But you can't do that now. You've got to be able to be very well-rounded, you know, high falls, fights, the whole bit, and you've got to work at that. Olympic swimmer Lila Finn got started in acrobatic and water stunts. It was a chance to go to Samoa, and I had returned from Berlin in the 1936 Olympics, and I thought, oh, this is great. So I went down to Samoa, double, double Dorothy Lemoore, and spent a month on the island of Samoa. Well, the first stunts were mainly diving off the boat, diving from a cliff, swimming in the ocean with sharks, and that type of thing. And then especially when there was the hurricane, then I doubled her in the hurricane also. After getting a taste of stunt work in her early 20s, Lila set out to promote her skills. She sent out copies of this film with the hope that movie producers would hire her as a stunt woman. Really, the business has not changed that much, I don't feel. Uh, the men that hire you, are, they hire you because they know your ability. And you, well, number one is you never take a job you cannot do. That is the key to my staying in the business this long. Lila's athletic training made her stunt work look easier than it was. But even veteran stunt people can get second thoughts about their work. Do I ever get scared? Yes. There are times your heart really pumps. You know, in places where you sometimes don't have a lot of control. In the blockbuster hit Total Recall, a mountain explodes and a Mars settlement gets torn apart. May Boss portrays one of the hapless victims in this catastrophe, having to act amid explosions, breaking glass, smoke, and wind. The Academy Award-winning special effects are impressive, but to make the scene really work, a large number of both male and female stunt actors are needed. We can do just about anything that a man can do. Uh, an interesting part of stunt work, especially as far as I'm concerned right now, is that I'm doing playing parts, and then there'll be an action, something in it. But that is primarily what I'm doing now, a little dialogue, a little part, and then some action. Instead of doubling for a star, here Lila plays a small role as a character who finds herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. The near miss is created without the aid of trick photography or clever editing. It's a true-to-life close call, so timing, concentration, and nerves of steel are crucial. Being a stunt woman has been a wonderful career, and I still love it. Still want to do all the jobs I can handle. You've got to stay in shape. I, I've always said I'll probably be doing push-ups in my wheelchair. Up next, we'll talk to a new breed of stunt woman and find out how they do what they do. We'll be right back. You've heard of a doctor taking his son into his practice and a lawyer bringing his son into his firm. I'd like you to meet two women who are carrying on another family tradition, stunt work. Here are Jeannie and her daughter, Yerlene Epper. It was Jeannie who was the stunt woman for Nancy Allen in Robocop. Now, this doesn't exactly look like a career a mother would want to pass on to her children, but Jeannie Epper has actually encouraged her daughter to follow in her footsteps. I've never tried to stop my children from doing stunts because Erlene, if she decides to take something, she's bright enough and smart enough to know whether she's capable. I would never capable. take something that I was not capable of doing. She might call me and say, you know, Mom, you know, they called me and asked me to do an 80-foot high fall. I'm not too sure. And then I'll say, well, who's coordinating it and who are the effects people? And you just, you know, through the business, through the years of working in this business, you know who to trust and who not to trust. When my daughter does stunts, um, I totally trust her because you've got to realize that my children have been listening to this. They listen to their grandfather talk about stunt work. They've listened to their mother, their uncles, their aunts. They've been raised, we're probably the largest stunt family in, in Hollywood. They know more in that little computer of theirs than most, you know, they, every day they hear this. It was, it's like talking at the dinner table at night. You talk about stunt work, what you did for the day, how you, how you rigged this, what the safety aspects were. So I felt that when my kids decided to do this for a living, because I have two sons that do it also, that they were mentally prepared. 
Jeannie and Yerlene got the opportunity to work together when stunt coordinator Terry Leonard brought them to Mexico for the film Romancing the Stone. I think my most favorite part was doing Romancing the Stone when I got to go down and do the second unit work, doubling Kathleen Turner and doing all the stuff in the Bronco, all the car work and passenger. And that was really fun because I got to be down there with my mom and Terry Leonard and it was a really fun job. Romancing the Stone was probably the most challenging, most exciting mixture of feelings I've ever had in a film. Um, when Terry Leonard called me and asked me if I wanted to do this particular film, I wasn't sure about going away for three months. The mudslide that I did on Romance in the Stone was probably the most physically demanding thing I've ever done in my life. Okay, let's make some time. You I was wet, cold, scared. You know, the mountain was almost straight up and down. It was so steep that we had to shoot it in like 40 to 50 to 60 feet at a time. They laid a cargo net up against the mountain. That's the only thing that we had to stop, stop you know, our body from traveling so fast. It was about a 300-yard run, and the top of this hill, it went straight down. Now, the trees that were there, obviously, we couldn't pull them out, so we had to design this waterway that gets filled with water to propel them down in the different sections in and out of the trees, and we had to stop them at the end of the run when they're out of camera. When you're going that fast, you're grabbing on, you know, to stop yourself into the cargo net, and I'm, I, mean, I almost got a dislocated shoulder one day. One day I got tipped upside down, my face got full of mud, I thought I was gonna drown. No, it wasn't fun. It became a very difficult stunt because they're getting drowned by water all the way down. All the mud got in their eyes and stuff, they'd have to wash their eyes out between takes. So after about four or five times, it becomes a job. It's no longer fun, and we did this for two weeks. Now, the current chairperson of the United Stunt Women's Association, J.D. David. Being a black woman in the business has actually been somewhat of an asset for me. I know that someone might look at it and say, well, you know, the opportunities may have been less, but like I said, when I first started, there was just a need for me. There were no black stunt women over, I think, five foot six. So um, the opportunities were wide open. I mean, when I first started, I couldn't believe the jobs that I got. It was the age of the black exploitation films. And there was Teresa Graves and um, uh, Pam Greer and, you know, tall women who needed stunt doubles. and so. I mean, I couldn't believe this was like great. It just was mushroomed for me. Since I started in the business, the business has evolved into more of a technical kind of business. It used to be more sort of crash and burn and now things are real high-tech, um, um, demanding. The stunts have gotten huge, huge as far as I'm concerned. I mean, they've got, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's more things demanded of us. As, you know, as each day goes by, as each show goes by, they just, you know, it just, it just gets larger and larger what they demand. In modern films, women are becoming more involved in action sequences. A brutal fist fight used to be a performance for men only. But scenes like this one from Total Recall indicate that women, too, can be convincing in aggressive roles. One might wonder if women have had difficulty being accepted within the male-dominated occupation of stunt doubling. Here are some thoughts from women who know. When I began in the business, the men accepted us. Uh, just like they do now. I've had very good acceptance in the business by men. Um, I know I, like I was probably the first woman to do a horse fall. And when you start doing things like that, uh, there's respect. You earn your respect by being good at what you do. And I'm not saying that, you know, I've been perfect at everything, because I haven't, but I feel like um, I've earned the respect through hard work, good stunt work, honesty, saying yes I can, 
And no, I can't, because most stunt coordinators that hire me know that if I say I can do it, I, I will do my best to do it. And if I can't do it, I can't do it. You know, stunt people do need big egos. I mean, it's real difficult to go out there and literally risk your life without a good reason. And I think an ego, like thinking you're great, is like one of the best reasons for risking your life. More action coming right up.